Okay, so the last topic here in this chapter is how, how do we evaluate scheduling algorithms? Scheduling algorithm evaluation. And one evaluation method is just the method that we have been using to evaluate algorithms uh, in, the, in this chapter, which is deterministic modeling that is based on uh, looking at the, you know, draw, drawing the, the Gantt chart for a process and calculating the average waiting time. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this method is not very practical. Uh, it's good for uh, explaining concepts and it's good for comparing different algorithms conceptually while calculating the average waiting time and you know for example seeing that uh, shortest job first is going to give the minimum average waiting time uh, round robin doesn't give uh, doesn't do uh, a good job at minimizing doesn't minimize the average waiting time but gives better responsiveness so this is good for uh, explaining concepts but from a practical point of view it's not uh, it's not very useful what is more useful is a simulation as we will see next but before we move to simulation we will review uh, our deterministic modeling evaluation uh, using this example and the reason why I would like to review this is that it's uh, you know this is going to be the uh, the topic of assignment three, which I will be discussing uh, in a few minutes. So we have process one with a CPU burst of ten, and process two with a CPU burst of twenty nine, process three with a CPU burst of three. Process four with a CPU burst of seven, and process five with a CPU burst of 12. Let's look at three different algorithms for scheduling this. So we have uh, first come, first served, non preemptive shortest job first, and round drop. So first come, first served is straightforward, just you know, few, just schedule them in order. And calculating the average waiting time is straightforward. Uh, the waiting time for P2 is 10 and for P3 is 39. It's very straightforward. Non preemptive shortest job first. Again, it's straightforward. So we look at the CPU bursts. P3 has the shortest. So we put P P3 first. Then, uh, the second shortest is P4, then uh, P1, then P5, then P2. We just order them by uh, the length of the CPU burst. And again here, calculating the waiting time for each process is straightforward. For P4, it's 3, for P1, it's 10, and so forth. Now, round robin. Uh, in round robin, and this is something that you will implement in assignment three, you have to be careful about the, when you calculate the average waiting time. So with round robin here, uh, let's assume a time quantum of 10. With a time quantum of 10, P1 gets 10 time units, then P2 gets 10 time units, then P3 gets 10, but it only uses three. <coughs> So P3 gets 10, but it uses 3, so it requests I.O. or terminates before uh, the, uh, the time quantum expires. P4 gets 10, but uses 7. P5 gets 12. Now, after the first round, we have 19 time units left for P2 and 2 time units for P5. All others are done. Done, done, done. And we have 19 more for P2, two more for P5. So we give P2 another 10. Then we give P5 10, but it only uses two. Then we give P2 uh, the remaining time, which is nine. Now, 
How do we calculate the waiting time in this case? So the waiting time waiting time of P1 is 0. P1 did not wait. Waiting time of P2 is the trickiest because P2 got three different time slices. So P2 first waited 10 to get its first time slice. Then it waited 40 minus 20 to get its second time slice. So it waited 20 more time units to get its second time slice. Then it waited two time units to get its third time slice. And that's 32. Waiting time of P3. P3 only waited 20 time units. Waiting time for P4. P4 waited 23 time units. Waiting time for P5. It first waited 30, then it waited another 20. So it waited 30 plus this 20. Uh, sorry, t 10, not 20. So it waited 30, then it waited 10. 30 plus 10, that's 40. Then we sum these numbers and divide by 5, and that gives the average waiting time. So this is what we have been doing. And this is what you will be doing in the assignment. Now, in practice, uh, you know, a process, a real process, has a long uh, trace in general, a long trace of CPU bursts and I/O requests. And in fact, you can instrument an operating system to to capture some of these traces for some of the processes. Like, uh, you know, you can have your operating system, you can add, uh, you know, functionality to the operating system to trace some of the processes, to trace the behavior of the process. First, it had a CPU burst of 10, then it requested I.O., and that I.O. took 213 milliseconds to complete, then the process got a CPU burst, and it used the CPU for 12 time units, or 12 milliseconds. Then it requested I.O. again, and that I.O. request took 112. Then it got another CPU burst, and so forth. So that the system can trace some of the processes and generate traces like this that can be used for simulation. So you can do simulation offline. So tracing some of the processes in a real system, uh, generating some of these files, some of these trace files, that will allow you to basically play back in uh, offline, play processes back offline, and you feed these into programs that simulate scheduling algorithms. So these simulators are just standalone simulators for the scheduling algorithms. You are abstracting a process behavior into CPU bursts and I.O. requests. And with this abstraction, you feed this into a simulator, and then the simulator will generate some performance statistics for you about a given algorithm. And you can you know, simulate three different algorithms and generate statistics. And based on these statistics, you evaluate them, and you select uh, one of them based on this simulation. Now, why do we do simulation? Why don't we just implement these algorithms in a real system? Because implementing them in a real system is uh, something costly. It's costly in terms of uh, you know, time and effort. Uh, the operating system is a very large and complex program. And implementing a scheduling algorithm into an operating system it takes a lot of development time and uh, development effort and debugging 
you know, usually it's hard to debug a small standalone program. Uh, so debugging an algorithm within a large scale system like an operating system is hard. So this is something expensive that people normally don't do until they feel that, until they have done something, some uh, preliminary evaluation using simulation that will show that a given algorithm is likely to be good. So then they will go ahead and implement it in a real system and try it. So before they uh, implement it in a real system, they do some kind of standalone simulation uh, to get an idea about the behavior. Then they implement it in the real system and try it and see its performance. But the catch here is that performance is dependent on the environment. So an algorithm that uh, you know, performs well in the uh, laptop or desktop environment may not perform well on a server that, service, uh, that serves uh, multiple users. Uh, so environments vary. And that's why evaluating a uh, scheduling algorithm is, uh, is tricky. It's not, it's not that uh, straightforward. Uh, and eventually, you will know. I mean, when you select a, a scheduling algorithm and implement it in a real system, eventually, you know, you will know how it performs. If it do, if it doesn't perform well, then you will know, and you will uh, need to modify it. As we, uh, when we talked about uh, scheduling in the Linux operating system, we saw how it evolved uh, you know, over time. The, the earlier algorithms were not doing well on multiprocessor systems, so they, uh, they uh, uh, change them to better algorithms that do uh, a better job at scheduling multiprocessor systems. Then they discovered that they're not uh, doing well uh, with interactive processes, so they change them and so forth. So it's, uh, in, in real life, it's, it's not uncommon to just implement an algorithm and then uh, you know, use it uh, for real loads and then discover that there is a, a weakness in that algorithm. Okay. Uh, all right. So this ends our discussion of CPU scheduling.